A fun fact for you, three of our most recent video thumbnails were designed, not by me or my team, but by artificial intelligence. And that sentence I just said was written by artificial intelligence. I'm about to go head to head against the most advanced AIs on the market right now to find out how intelligent they've actually gotten, if they're a good thing, or if we're all actually willingly creating our own demise. So, to understand the potential dilemmas it might cause, what is AI? I mean, on a simple level, AI is just computer systems that think in ways that mimic human intelligence. But in practice, it involves companies hurling out terms like machine learning, neural networks, natural language processing, that most of us half understand, but not fully. So, the first, most important aspect of AI is machine learning, where we create programs that can find patterns in a set of data, and then use those patterns to learn how to make accurate predictions when it sees new data. So, for example, this is my cat, Milo. If I take a photo of him with Google Lens on my phone, Google can use the billions of cat photos it's seen before this to recognize that this is a cat, it's gonna tell me what type of cat, which I didn't even know, even though it's never seen this exact picture of a cat before. And then it's gonna use the data from this picture to further train itself on what future cats could look like. So, now that we've got the basic machine learning in place, we can talk about neural networks, which are actually another kind of machine learning system, except they're specifically modeled after the structure of the human brain, with artificial nodes made to act like our neuron cells. And that allows them to not just take in all the information, but also weigh the significance of different pieces of data, deciding what's important and what's not important to help you specifically get to the conclusion that you're looking for. And this is important because as intelligent as these AI programs are, they can run into strange errors that we wouldn't have ever seen coming. Like when this one system was trained to recognize images of a specific fish called a tench, it started producing a very odd output. Every time you'd ask it to show you what a tench looked like, it would actually show you human fingers on a green background. And that's because almost every photo of a tench online is a photo of someone holding the fish as a trophy after fishing. The AI's got no idea what a fish actually is, so it's instead been training itself to think that the fingers around the fish were a part of the fish. And if anything, because they're more different to the fish, the main point of interest on it. So, to see a neural network in action is gonna be me, versus Autodraw. That software was developed by a team at Google and uses a neural network to not just analyze what I'm drawing, neatening up the lines as I go, but predicting what I'm trying to make and offering to make it for me. I've been tasked with making a balloon, a flower, and a football. Okay, so it's me with a pen versus me with Autodraw. Three, two, one, go. So the first thing we've got to draw is a balloon. I forgot how hard it was to draw with a trackpad. Crikey, that looks pretty bad. Oh, it recognizes it. So I tap that and it's even better than my drawing. Last time I drew a flower was about 17 years ago. I'm drawing this faster than I expected to be, but it's just not looking great. Thankfully, I didn't need to finish that. Okay, and then football. Is it hexagons or pentagons on a football? This is the beautiful thing about AI. It doesn't need to think about what a football looks like. It just knows. So I tap that and we're done. <laughs> this does not look like a football at all. So I don't think I did bad with the drawing. It's just that I got stuck, the AI didn't, and it also did it faster and neater. And then there's the third key pillar, natural language processing, which is where machine learning computers learn how to correctly use human language by training on the split up and broken down grammatical components of speech and writing, which is a lot harder than it sounds. Because to do this, the AI not just has to understand the general logical rules of language, but also all of those subtle human intricacies that you just can't calculate. So I thought the best way to see if AI really gets it is to see if it can make a joke that's actually funny. And to make sure it's making the joke, not just finding it online, I'm gonna add in a constraint. Tell me a tech joke about Apple. Why did the Apple employee quit his job? Because he couldn't find a Windows to open. That's actually funny. And it's kind of crazy because if you'd asked a stand-up comedian who'd been doing this for 20 years to come up with a joke like that with those constraints on the spot, they wouldn't have been able to do it. So you've got all these different forms of AI, but what brings them together is that they all rest on one more key term that you'll have been hearing a lot about lately, big data, which is exactly what it says on the tin. Absolutely gargantuan sets of highly varied data. Sets so huge that it could take hundreds of human lifetimes just to read through all of it. But because of how cheap data storage is getting and how powerful computers are becoming, can be processed in minutes and theoretically seconds by them. Let's be very clear, computers now are far beyond those classroom calculators that can perform, say, a calculation per second. Modern supercomputers have already surpassed one quintillion calculations per second. I'm just gonna let the zero scroll past me on screen because that is a ridiculously hard number for us to even comprehend. So, now that we've understood what AI actually is, just before the very real problems, 
is also a major upside. One of the biggest benefits of machine learning is that it only needs to learn to do something once. When it can do that, it can repeat that task infinitely and just keep getting better at it, which can basically eliminate boring busy work for us. Checking contracts, filling in spreadsheets, turning news into written articles, anything where enough pattern recognition could allow it to be done, AI can do it. ChatGPT actually just got upgraded last week to GPT-4. It's more creative, it has better awareness of the outcome you're looking for, so it can tailor results to it, and it's so much smarter. To give you an idea, the company tested both ChatGPT and GPT-4 by making them sit a number of real-life exams, like the Biology Olympiad, and while ChatGPT scored in the 31st percentile, meaning that 69% of people would have scored higher, Nice. GPT-4 is in the 99th percentile. It's better than 99% of people at a test designed for humans. To the point where there is a live demo of GPT-4 building an entire website just from a sketch scribbled together in 20 seconds. It's hard to stress just how much time these tools can save us. Like one thing that me and my team spend quite a lot of time doing is removing the backgrounds of images. So let's say we wanted to put this lovely image of the Mona Lisa on a different background. The normal thing I would do is use this selection tool and then by hand try to very carefully navigate around the shape that I want to keep. But the problem is, because this works manually, just by basically detecting what's similar to the colour you're selecting, it sometimes can't differentiate between backgrounds and foregrounds when they're similar to each other. Also, I mean, this is just so long. Look at this. <laughs> That's the image I have remaining. <laughs> Not the best. But we don't need to do that anymore. There's literally a piece of software online called Pixel Cut, where if I take the image I have, drop it inside, it automatically detects that this is a human subject, figures out what's hair and what's background, and just does it for you. And then any bits that aren't quite right, you can just use the brush and fudge over it. Done. The difference between both the amount of effort put in and the quality of the output produced is night and day. But that's not the only perk of AI. It's also always on. Unlike a human worker who on average might be productive like three or four hours a day, AI doesn't get tired, it doesn't get ill, it doesn't need holiday, it can just work. And this means that let's say you leave a powerful AI in charge of your live chat service, or for taking calls from your customers. Then providing it's been trained and has been given the tools to be able to schedule customer appointments and solve customer problems is actually a win for both the company and the customer. But it goes further because AI is not just something that can save human effort, it can also take us further by doing things that we couldn't even possibly do ourselves. To the point where it can save lives. By being able to comb through enormous amounts of data, more so than any trained professional has even the time to do in their entire career, AI is actually better suited to looking through patient blood tests or physical scans and using pattern recognition to diagnose diseases far earlier and more reliably. Since as people, we have to wait for more obvious symptoms to show up. And if you're enjoying this video, then a sub to the channel would be intelligent. AI can tailor your technology to work around you. Like almost every modern phone actually uses AI to understand your usage habits and to get apps ready to launch before you even click on them, or hibernate other apps that you don't use very often. Or search engines like Bing are now using AI to act like a kind of web search co-pilot who can answer your questions in a more natural human conversational tone. Or what Google started experimenting with with Google Assistant, allowing it to call up places on your behalf to make bookings for you. Okay, so let's just say you have a very specific problem. If you just type that into normal Google search, then largely what it's going to try and do is just to give you something that matches as many of the keywords that you've typed, which in this case is just a load of recipes, not what I need right now. But if I instead use GPT-4, it's going to tackle the problem from the perspective of it needing a solution. If your asparagus has been burnt, it may have a bitter taste and a charred texture. And then it's literally giving me a five-step guide on how to recover my asparagi. And it rounds off by actually saying, with these steps, you may be able to salvage your burnt asparagus and turn it into a tasty dish. This is literally like having a world-renowned asparagus expert sitting in the room with me. And probably the most prominent perk that we've experienced so far, AI can also be a tool for creation. With tools like DALI and ChatGPT and SoundDraw, allowing basically anyone with an internet connection to generate completely new images, stories, and even music from scratch. So it's me versus an AI called Soundful. What is up with this chair? I think I remember how to do this. <laughs> Somehow I did. <laughs> I'm actually quite proud of myself. All right, time to see what you can do. So you search for contemporary piano up top, and we hit that generate button. It's actually kind of sad how easy it is just to generate music now. Oh my God. Oh, it's just embarrassing, isn't it? <laughs> how does AI understand the, the nuances of music? It feels like such a personal thing, like someone's put love and care into this track, but it's just a machine. 
I know I'm trying to prove a point here, but I'm also just tired of losing. <laughs> but it's in this process of content generation where we start to find the problems with AI. Like, sure, the pictures of cats doing handstands on Mars in the style of Picasso that we're seeing right now from the stable diffusion AI, they are new original content that technically hasn't been made before. But then because these AI tools have only learned how to make this stuff by combing through millions of pictures online of other people's cats, shots taken by NASA or other space organizations to understand Mars, and then Picasso's actual art to recreate his style, it creates the first issue of who actually owns the output. I mean, Picasso himself had to spend decades training to be able to do what he could do, and that's why his most famous painting sold for over a hundred million dollars. But then, if I ask AI to just make something similar using Picasso's style, isn't that just an indirect form of copyright infringement? Artists aren't exactly giving permission to AI companies to be able to train their AI using their work. Shouldn't they have a choice or like receive some sort of commission? But then that doesn't work either, because if you paid commission, how would you decide who gets how much? Because every single search request is going to use a different amount of data from each party who's contributed to it. But it's not just art that AI can make, it's also people. And this is scary. I found this machine learning guru called Santiago on Twitter, and he's basically saying that in just four to five years time, every image you see on social media will be created by AI. And to prove his point, overnight created an Obama generator that can create real life looking photos of Barack Obama in any situation he wants to be in. Pretty cool if you could only do that for yourself. You could create photos of you dressed up in fancy clothes without even needing to do any of the dressing up. Oh. But if you're not Barack Obama in this situation, isn't it also just a little bit alarming that people have access to you like that? And it's not just image creators like Dali posing a massive threat of plagiarism and scams. ChatGPT has become the way for students to have full essays written for them, with over half of them in a recent survey admitting to doing this exact thing. And yeah, sure, you could say, well, this is just like when calculators first got introduced into maths. We just need to design a set of assessments that factor in that students can now use AI. But what would that look like? AI programs are becoming more intelligent every single day, far faster than schools are realistically going to be able to keep changing the curriculum to accommodate. The difference is this, being able to use a calculator in an exam, it still requires the student to use a level of reasoning skills, analysis, to decide what calculation needs to be done. But AI, because it's modeled off human thinking, can, or at least will soon be able to, offload all thinking entirely. And so there is the very serious question of, going forward 20 years, where do we actually fit into the picture? We won't be better at anything. Okay, so to give you an example, I've been reviewing tech for half my life now. And if you just asked me to off the top of my head whittle off a review for the iPhone 14, I could probably do it. But as soon as you add even one constraint to that, such that I have to think about how I'm gonna say it, I think I would break down. Okay, let's try it. Uh, give me a rule. Use words starting with letters A through to I. Oh God, okay. And uh, make it suitable for a five-year-old. <laughs> the... I can't even use the. Apple's iPhone 14 is fun because it has a large, I can't use large. This is a mess. Oh goodness. If this can do that, I am gonna be absolutely flawed. <laughs> it says, Apple's iPhone 14 is amazing. A big bright display dazzles eyes, buttons feel great, colorful cases are delightful, entertaining for all. Cameras capture fantastic fun, giving good, happy images. Enjoy. <laughs> I mean, that is insane. Now, when people talk about the risks of AI, you'll often hear about the singularity, the point at which the AI systems we've built become so advanced that they're able to think and act for themselves, inevitably deciding to disobey humans and take over the world. But the bigger problem we're facing right now is not the possibility of AI refusing to do what we want, but instead doing exactly what we're programming to. That's what's happening with the new Bing, Microsoft's chat GPT powered version of their search engine, which acts like an AI co-pilot to help you find the answers to your questions. And personally, I really like the idea of asking a super intelligent robot the answers to my questions. A completely unbiased source like that is the best thing you need when you're researching. But the problem is, it's not unbiased. We'd like to imagine that by giving these AI systems the power to independently learn and improve themselves, that they'll just happen to become these completely impartial truth-telling machines. I think that normal non-AI computer programs have lured us into this false sense of security because they work in a very simple, methodical, binary manner that we can keep track of. But in order to make AI behave more human, they have to be trained using human influences. And it's impossible to completely keep their biases out of the final product. Like you might 
remember that in 2017, Amazon had to completely scrap their new AI recruitment tool, which automatically scanned through resumes and suggested which candidates to hire because it turned out to be extremely sexist. The tool was basically looking at the company's own hiring data, seeing that they'd hired a lot more men than women in general, and realized technically correctly that male candidates had a better chance of being hired at their company. So it stopped recommending applications from women, especially if they'd mentioned specifically attending a women's college. There's no one person to blame here. The AI doesn't know what's right and wrong. It's just that it's almost impossible to program a machine learning system without biases like this. And the danger is, by putting our trust in a neural network that very few people really understand the inner workings of, we won't actually know what their biases are until problems have been caused as a result of them. The other thing people have started to notice when using this new Bing chatbot is almost like a, an alternate personality. It sounds very weird to say, but almost like the machine is going through puberty. Like for instance, Bing has a tendency to just straight up argue with you. At this early stage, it's really common for it to make mistakes, get things wrong, and even bizarrely just to make things up and stand by them. Usually if you double down and point it out, it will back down with a meek little apology that weirdly makes me feel bad for criticizing it. But people have found that if they push it too hard, Bing just blows up. And this is what we get for training a machine using people's internet behavior as the influence. People are not their best selves on the internet. And if an AI with this potentially destructive personality had a more important job than just advising people on their internet searches, you can see why this is a problem, right? There's a hundred other concerning things we could talk about here. But the point is, continuing down the path of advancing AI tech might just be about to make things worse. Not because they're going to disobey us, but because they're going to do exactly what we're telling them to. Okay, so let's just stop the whole AI thing. But can you? AI has no government regulation. There's no one body that controls it or systems in place to keep it in check. Plus, AI tools are already so baked into society that even if every single government around the world got together and agreed to ban it, which they won't, by the way, it's just too capable a tool to ignore. In a best case scenario, it'll just be used by criminals and bad actors, giving them a huge advantage over people trying to be good. But more likely, I think, many countries would just secretly not follow their own bans to be able to push themselves ahead of others. So long as the internet exists and companies and countries are continuously trying to progress, I think it's too late to put the genie back in the bottle. And so the next best thing for us is to adapt and to learn how to use AI to the best of our abilities. Which is exactly what Elon Musk is trying to do with Neuralink. He believes that in order to keep up with AI and not to become completely obsolete as a species, we need to integrate with it using brain chips. An equally exciting and terrifying concept, but I've got a full video all about that over here. So, since AI is out there and we need to become comfortable with it, you have to try Opera's internet browser. It's the first browser that has ChatGPT baked into the sidebar, so you can talk to it without even changing tabs while browsing. Plus, let's say you come across an article that you're really interested in, but it's 5,000 words. With this browser, you just click shorten, and Opera will use the natural language processing of ChatGPT to summarize it. So whatever your brief is, you can get a tailored answer that suits it. Or another really smart trick that I've been using it for recently, lucid mode. Whatever content that you watch on this browser, whether it's 15-year-old beardless Aaron or 27-year-old grizzly beard Aaron, it improves it. It reduces blur, it increases sharpness and contrast, it makes subpar content look acceptable, and makes already crisp videos look another level above. It's the best way to watch this video. And you can enable all of this stuff via the easy setup button in the top right corner. Opera says this is just the start. They've actually announced a collaboration with OpenAI, the company behind ChatGPT. But I won't spoil the details, link in the description now to get it for free.